water cascades over a subterranean cliff into a cool, clean stream. This landslide looks like it occurred ages ago. It would take you a year to clear it away. Although there is a hidden room behind the waterfall, in almost every version of Shadowgate, this landslide is nothing more than a red herring. Like several other doors and passages in the game, it looks like it might go somewhere, but it's really just a dead end. Except that in the original Macintosh version, there is a way to get behind the landslide, but what's hidden in the secret room beyond the rocks was only the tip of the iceberg. To perform this trick, it's important that you're playing the correct version of the game. Shadowgate was released on a ton of different platforms, but the only version that has this secret room is the original Macintosh version. You can download a very nice copy of Macintosh Shadowgate on Steam, but I tried hundreds of times to make the secret room appear on the Steam version, and I was unable to do it. That means that the only way to access this room is to find an old enough Macintosh computer that can run a game from 1987. Certainly something easier said than done. Once you're playing the correct version of the game, this trick isn't that hard to do. Make sure that you grab the key out of the skull above the entrance door. You don't need it to open this door, but you will need it in the next room. Once you get in here, we're going to operate the key that we just found on the door in the middle of the room. That will open it up. And you also want to grab the torches here. The first torch that you have lit will burn out very quickly, so you might as well light up a second one right away and grab a third one just in case. Here in this hallway, you'll want to open up this book. Inside you'll find a key, and we're going to need to use that key to open the closet in the previous room. Inside that closet, we're going to be able to get the sling, and the sling is one of the items we'll need to use to be able to do this trick. So don't forget to go in here, operate the key on the door, open it up, and go inside to get the sling. There's also a sword inside here, but we're not going to need it to be able to do this trick. So make sure that you get the sling, you can leave any burnout torches behind, and then return to the stone passageway. Make sure that you grab the special torch. We are going to need that, and you might as well pick up this other torch as well. We can open up the rock at the end of the hall, and we're going to go through that hidden passage. Operate the torch on the left side and go through the door, and then cross the bridge on the left. Here you're going to operate your torch on the special torch, and then operate the special torch on the wraith to get him out of the way. Behind the wraith is the epore room, and you want to close the bottle on the left and then add it to your inventory. This is a very important item that we're going to need to be able to perform the trick. You can grab a couple extra torches here if you want, but once you have that bottle in its closed state, we're going to go all the way back to this hallway and then head to this room where we'll open the door on the right. If you have the bottle from the left side of the epore room and the sling in your possession, you're ready to perform this trick. So make your way to the waterfall room, and here's the landslide that we're trying to clear away. The first thing you need to do is operate one of the stones into your sling. Make sure you do that first. Now we're going to place the bottle, and it needs to be placed in this very precise location. We're trying to line up the upper left corner of the bottle with a single pixel in the background. I'm going to zoom in on it in a moment so you can see this better. If you think you have the right position, operate a torch on the bottle, and then your next action must be to operate the sling on the bottle. Now if you're not in the right spot, you'll want to load another rock in the sling, reposition the bottle, and make sure to heat it up again. 
Here is the place where you want to position it. You're trying to position the upper left corner in relation to this pixel. So when you think you have the right spot, make sure you heated the bottle first, then operate the sling, and if you did it right, it will clear the landslide, and then we can go into the secret room. Inside is a room unlike any other in the game. A plain white window containing just two objects and a very strange title. The Todd Zipnik Secret Memorial Room. If you examine the strange T-mon, you'll see that it's the fabled symbol of the Circle of Twelve. And then, if you open up the bottle of wine, you can consume the liquid inside, although it doesn't really do anything to you. It just says that the liquid from the bottle flows easily down your throat, and that it tasted good. There's not too much else you can do here. If you hit the T-mon symbol, that will bring you out of the room. Very strange. The most mysterious thing about this room is its name. Todd Zipnik was the founder of ICOM Simulations, the company that developed Shadowgate. Zipnik tragically lost his battle with cancer in 1991, but when Shadowgate was released in 1987, he was very much alive. Did the developers know that the company's founder didn't have much time left and created this room as a way to honor his memory? Or was this just a playful joke that reads differently through modern eyes? There may only be one person who has the answer. I'm Dave Marsh, I'm the founder of Zojoy, and I was the designer and illustrator of Shadowgate back in 1987. To understand where the most secret room in the game came from, we have to go back to the beginning. When Dave Marsh was growing up, gaming was undergoing a revolution. In the 70s, this new wonderful game came out called Dungeons and Dragons. It was, of course, made by Gary Gygax. And Gary Gygax at that time lived in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, which wasn't very far from us. I had a friend whose parents would drive us there. And the best part about it was on the corner of, of a, a couple streets was a game shop, the first game shop called The Dungeon. Gygax would be there from time to time. And really all they sold was Dungeon Master's Guides and Player's Handbook and Monster Manuals and, and lead <laughs> figures that we would paint and paints and other things. And there wasn't a whole lot more than that, but you know, there'd be campaigns going and things there. That was my earliest memory of walking into something and just saying, this is the kind of world that I would love to one day create. So in 1985, I was working in a junk mail room, loading printers with junk mail. When I met a friend named Terry Schulenberg and he was a programmer for Icom Simulations, I learned that you know they were making these adventure games. And I thought this is the perfect chance for me to take what I love about D&D, which are these individual rooms with puzzles in those rooms and collecting some treasure, some object that I might be able to use later. That's how our DM would work. And they lent me a Macintosh and said, hey, you want to try making a game? And I said, I'd love to. So I was working with McPaint. We're in my, you know, my bedroom of my parents' house, right? We're coming up with all this stuff and we're working on it. And eventually they said, well, we'd like to give you a job. And I said, well, I have to make $7 an hour. And so they said, okay, well, we'll it's going to be tough, but we'll go ahead and do that. Of course, one of the biggest challenges developers faced in the mid-1980s was getting the game to fit on just a single disc or cartridge. Again, I mean, we're talking about these little cartridges. I mean, at that point, they're not floppies, they're, they're cartridges, and you just had to fit an entire game on one. They were being published by Mindscape, which was a company down the road from us, and everything was cost-cutting. I had a producer, a guy named Dave Feldman, who's just a, a great product manager, and he started going through the design that we had already done and started saying, well, maybe we should cut this and we should cut that. So just getting the game to fit on those cartridges as it was, or those, those types of floppies, was amazing yeah, that it even worked. And sometimes when a room would get cut from the game, the developers would just permanently lock the door. You're near the end of the game, right? You're at the wind well, and there's a door there to the left of the well, and it went somewhere. It's one of these puzzles that never made it. Of course, it didn't fit on the floppy, so we decided to kill it. But we left the door in there and then just locked it and never did anything else with it. 
And so people had always asked, what's behind that door? What's behind that door? And, and there's, there's nothing. While we may never know for certain what was hidden beyond the locked door beside the wind well, early design documents reveal several possibilities. You are now in what appears to be another tower room, which is, I guess, a good thing. It says, a chandelier, exclamation point. A rope is tied to the post. There's a massive form of a desert scorpion. Right here, you must operate the sword or just about anything on the rope, and then the chandelier has crushed the scorpion. You can then leave. Or perhaps it was an intense battle with a deadly basilisk? We did have a basilisk room, and I remember drawing it, and it was in a hole and had to get a mirror, and he needed to petrify itself, but it just didn't make the cut. But probably it went back and had something to do with that. The, the snake statue ended up becoming the Staff of Ages, yeah. One of the other rooms that was omitted from the game featured an encounter with death wraiths. We had death wraiths in the game, you know, which is different than the wraith that's right outside the bridge's room. You must place the crystal lantern from room 26 on the pedestal to kill the wraith. However, if you use anything else on it or try to leave, you would die. If you use the crystal lantern or place it on the pedestal, show a ray coming out of the lantern and hitting the wraith. The wraith is then inverted, so we inverted the black and white, and disappears leaving only ashes behind, where you have just <laughs> disposed of the death wraith. Like I dumped it into garbage or something. <laughs> and sometimes major elements of the game were changed. In the case of the dragon's lair, originally it wasn't going to be a dragon at all. The snow tiger slowly comes out of the cave into the light and stops in the center of the room. You must use any torch on the snow tiger. If you don't use a torch and try to attack the monster or leap up the stairs, you die. Warrior, the snow tiger has ripped you to shreds. If you use the torch on the tiger, then the tiger disappears and a, pud <laughs> a puddle appears. Now you know why it's called a snow tiger, for you have melted it. If you try to leave through the cave, you can't. Tis the tiger's den, you can't leave through this route for some reason. But what about that secret room behind the rock slide? You want to talk about the Todd Zipnik room? Yes, we definitely want to know about the Todd Zipnik room. As we've talked about, when we couldn't fit something on the cartridge, um, we just eliminated the room. And in many cases, there was an entrance to that room. And so in, this, in, in the waterfall room, there is a set of stairs that go somewhere, but I just drew boulders in front of it and it blocked your way. There is a way to get past that and then get in there. And then we have what's called the Todd Zipnik Memorial Room or something like that. And I think that it might have been either maybe Todd Squires or Fred Allen or one of the programmers um, that decided that would be cool to put in there. But it's just really a white room with a bottle in it and an icon for our debugging program. So what was Todd like? So Todd Zipnick was the president and CEO of Icom Simulations, and he was the guy who hired me. He was a lovely man. He was he was a, he, he was he was great. He was super creative. He was super fun. He loved the industry. He loved everything about it. I think he had made a ton of money, you know, and done really well on Apple II games before he embraced the Macintosh. And of course, it's kind of through his genius that, that Icon was creating these first-person adventure games. I mean, they're all Windows-based. I mean, it was really unheard of, right? All the games that were coming out at that time were not taking advantage of that. And so these McVentures, which was what they were called, uh, Macintosh Adventures, took advantage of that. But Todd was great. We had the kind of relationship with Todd that, you know, we could kind of poke fun at him if we wanted to. He could take it. You can also see evidence of the playful relationship that Todd Zipnick had with his employees in Deja Vu, where one of the bathroom walls features graffiti that says Zip is a dip. Unfortunately, Todd passed away of cancer in 1991. Just a, a lovely man. Sadly, Todd Zipnick isn't alive today to see how many people still love and appreciate the games his company created. But his memory lives on in a small white room hidden behind a seemingly impenetrable rock slide. So pop the cork and raise a glass to Todd Zipnick. The liquid from the bottle flows easily down your throat. That was good. Well, I hope you enjoyed this very special episode of You Can Beat Video Games, and I want to give a special thank you to Dave Marsh for taking the time to do this interview. If you enjoyed it, make sure to give it a like, and make sure to subscribe for more videos. 
because there will always be more hidden rooms to reveal. And that's why we'll be back again next week with another video game you can beat. Thanks for watching.